so hello, my name is Armin. I usually do lots and lots of Python software development. And now, as of a couple of years ago, I also started doing a lot more Rust. Um, I do most of my work as an open source work. So I have lots of open source libraries. And as of recently, uh, also my paying job is thankfully open source related uh, because we are an open source project. Perfect. This is where you can find uh, my Twitter handle, my GitHub pro uh, projects, and the slides of the talk will be available there as well on the last URL. Perfect. So um, now my work currently is Sentry, and Sentry is a project where we show you when you have an application, it crashes. And the reason that's relevant to this talk is because we introduced a lot of Rust code into this. Um, so to get an idea roughly what the system looks like, uh, this is the user interface. There's a list of issues that you can see. So any problem that you have in your server app or in your browser app or whatever you have can be sent through an agent to the system. So there's a processing pipeline um, eventually will show up in the UI. Um, so that's roughly how this looks like. This is what an event looks like if you have it. Um, and so there's a lot of a wealth of information that needs to be processed in this whole thing. Um, the other important part is that we are an open source project. So we, we do have a business model behind it, which is a, a software as a service business. But the core of the application, and also, in fact, what we host for users, is an open source project. Um, and this is sort of the two parts of it. One of them is uh, Sentry IO, which is the software as a service hosted version. But it's running the same code as we have on um, uh, for, the, for the open source customers. So there's actually no difference between the two. And this is very important for our development process because it sets some limitations in regards to how we can pick and use technologies. So let's see. Um, so the most important, um, if you take a regular software as a service business, um, one of the big advantages of it is that you have a full control of your technology stack. So you can pick very exotic uh, databases, for instance. Um, because you can just license it for yourself. You pay whatever the, uh, the, um, the license fee is for using that database. So you have um, a lot of possibility in particularly choosing technology. Um, for us, it's a little bit harder because we are confined within the open source environment. So there are no commercial uh, databases we can use, for instance. Um, and it also means that because customers use it on-prem, um, we actually have to support multiple databases. So we have to support Postgres, we have to support MySQL. Um, so, and this is the environment in which we started introducing Rust as an additional language. Um, so, our technology stack, for the most part, is Python. Um, so, David Kramer, the CEO of Sentry, um, me and Matt, we were the first people sort of that did uh, development work on Sentry. Uh, you know Python for a very long time. We used Python. We used Python before Sentry, during Sentry's development, obviously. Um, and that was sort of the, 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 the place where we started with. Um, and we're very conservative in putting more te different technologies into this environment. Um, the biggest sort of services that we are running is um, for our own installation, not for our customer's installation, is Postgres for the main database. Um, we use React for storing um, uh, large non-index blob data. Um, we, we use S3 for some larger data that doesn't need to be accessed that frequently. Um, we have uh, Redis for our main queuing, uh, not queuing, our caching system. Uh, we also use Memcache, but Redis is a big part of our caching story. Um, and then we have RabbitMQ. And, but what you can see from this is that it's fairly conservative stack. Um, there is, while, while there is React on it, we don't actually use anything fancy of it. We treat it as a key value store. Um, so we are very careful with introducing new technologies, and yet we picked up Rust as, as one part of it. Um, and let me just skip this. Perfect. Um, and one of the reasons why we picked Rust is we have an aversion to some degree to um, service-oriented architecture. It's not that we dislike it. We, we do have some services that we are using from other bits and pieces of our infrastructure. Uh, but we prefer internal uh, modular code over doing more HTTP calls internally in our stack. Uh, it makes debugging much easier. It makes deployments much easier. It also helps us get the software running on the customer's uh, um, own installation easier and it's easier to, to, to understand from customer support ticket what's, what's going on in their on-prem installation, the fewer moving parts you have. Um, and because we are confined to some degree with um, our 
internal modular but kind of monolithic code base to, um, to do most of our work in Python. Um, so the traditional way in which you would extend Python outside of the Python language itself is typically a C extension module. Um, and none of us are particularly big friends of writing C and C++ code for this sort of stuff. Um, but we managed to actually introduce Rust uh, like normal people would do um, a C or C++ extension. Um, so this is the reason why we have Rust in our code base is because we're actually using it as, as Python extension modules. Um, so how do we do, so how does Rust fit in the whole thing? It, it primarily fits because we have the extension modules um, and this is our avenue of getting Rust into it. Um, but this is not the first area where we had Rust. Um, so actually, why is there Rust in the first place? So we didn't, we didn't just decide we're going to start writing past Rust extension modules for Python. That sort of came later. The reason for this is that I actually liked Rust and I started writing a project for Sentry, which is a command line client. Um, and this was our first experiment with getting Rust into production use. So the most important thing about Rust as a programming language, and this is why we, uh, why we started using it, is so we built this command line client. And Rust as a programming language, if you haven't been exposed to it at all, is compiled. Um, and because it's compiled, um, well, not necessarily because it's compiled, but one of the benefits of it is that it brings in the final executable that you can distribute to customers, it brings all the requirements that it has to run. So all you have to do is compile the executable for a platform, and then a user can run it, and it doesn't have to. Uh, there is no requirement for the runtime environment of JavaScript or Python or anything like that on the system to be in a certain state. Um, so we we were very concerned about the idea of writing the command line utilities in Python because we knew it's very hard to guarantee that everybody's Python environment is is in a good state. Distributing Python command line tools is is not easy. Um, so th that's why we were looking at other solutions, and Rust was uh, was my favorite from my personal experience with using it before, um, and that's kind of what we settled with. Um, and then only later on we used some of the stuff we wrote for the command line tool and actually reused it on the server side. Um, so it was never really an intention to start with Rust on the server. Um, so let's do this. Uh, so this is, um, if you can see this, this is a, a print from the dependencies of uh, Sentry CLI. So this is the Mac version. Uh, I don't know how good you can see it, but effectively you can see that the only dynamic linked libraries that it depends on are system provided. So we, can, we know that these will be there. Uh, for instance, if there is a security issue in curl, then Apple will patch this hopefully in time, uh, and we don't have to do it ourselves. So this, the idea is that we can, um, we, we, we distribute executables uh, that only use the system libraries which we can depend on, and everything else is statically compiled into it. So for instance, what you don't see here is that uh, we, we have libgit2 uh, as part of Sentry CLI. Um, so that, that is an internal statically linked library. Um, and the, the idea behind Sentry CLI was to some degree that a user can just do this scary curl to bash installation or use npm or homebrew but it will be very easy for us to make a new release it's basically one new binary for each ar architecture go to github um, and then as a script you can fetch it from so it's it's very easy to get it into the build process that was our goal and that's what we achieved with rust um, and so the question is what alternative would that be to rust so obviously you could achieve the same thing with go c and c plus plus those are the main contenders um, and one of the reasons why we really liked Rust was the Crates I.O. ecosystem. So Rust is very modern in, in the sense of, uh, of, of the ecosystem because it comes with a package manager called Cargo. Um, and people distribute Crates, which is reusable Rust code on Crates I.O. And it actually turns out that there was a lot of stuff we could already reuse that the community built. Um, and it turns out the quality of uh, packages for Rust Crates is, is surprisingly high. Um, so the, the community is actually doing a really good job in writing crates. Um, and so there was a lot of stuff we could use and that made the development of the a command line client much easier than, um, than, than it would have been in, in other languages. So I was looking at Go also, um, and there were some things that I will go into later on um, where you can see like why we chose Rust. Um, so we retracted basically the idea of writing it in Python or JavaScript because we would have to ship the runtime and that's kind of tricky. Um, so, 
The, the, the best part, I hope this is the correct slide, yeah. So the, the best part about Rust for us was the serialization support, and that was kind of why we chose it. Um, you can very easily consume RESTful services that pro expose JSON data, and you, all you have to do is mirror the, the response data or the request data in Rust structs, and it will generate you serializers for it, and they're very handy to use. They have very good error handling support, so it, the, the code becomes very readable. Um, and there is a lot of um, really good already existing infrastructure for building very nice command line uh, interfaces. So um, that was the story for the command line client, and we had this. And one of the things the command line client was doing is the goal was that the customer will be able to um, check before they are submitting stuff to the API that the data that they are submitting is actually in a good state. Um, so what you have to consider here is that if you, for instance, send a JavaScript event from a browser. So imagine you have a, a, an, a browser application where there's an error in it, and then our agent will submit that error from your JavaScript application to our server. Um, and typically, JavaScript code is minified, which means it's very hard for us to actually give you useful information. So what we have to do is we have to consume source maps. And source maps are huge JSON data blobs, uh, which we can resolve and then try to build better stack traces out of this. Um, and it turns out that it's very easy to build source maps, which are not in a good format. So one of the tasks that the Center CLI tool had was, before uploading the source maps to us, we would verify locally that the source maps are actually in a good state. Because there's information in source maps which might only be able to be processed on the client side. So for instance, you might have source code references in the source maps, um, which you never upload, and they're like your local files. So by executing it on your computer, we can then look at those files and inline the source code as necessary. Um, so that is something that we had to do on the client. We couldn't do it on the server. Um, so we already had this really good uh, source map library within Sentry CLI. Um, and then um, we had performance problems with the source map parser on the server side. Um, and so this, is, this was the image from the, uh, from the blog post, but you can see here is a CPU use. Um, and I think there was a similar one that looked almost the same, which was memory use. Um, so we actually managed to get f like t uh, 10 times saving, uh, so to 10% of what we had before, I think, um, by switching a specific functionality on the server side that was dealing with source map parsing from Python to Rust. And that was, th that was the part where we were like, this is really interesting. We can actually benefit from reusing some of the stuff we do on the client on the server. Um, so we basically built uh, a Python extension module that reused some of the bits and pieces that we built for Sentry CLI for the server side. Um, so source map was the first one. Um, the next one, um, well, I'll just skip this. So the, um, the, the savings were, uh, for users, quite nice because it also meant that the time to, from error to you seeing it went from 20 seconds to less than a, less than a second. Um, and it also meant that the backlog on our queues was heavily reduced. We could reduce the total number of workers. Um, and that was a performance gain. And the reason why we actually ended up with such a big performance gain, um, I just, the reason why we ended up with such a big performance gain was that the vast majority of time spent in dealing with source maps uh, before in Python was actually memory allocations. There were so many little bits and pieces in the JSON dump that when you parse them in Python, there were a lot of individual objects being created. There was a lot of allocations taking place. So we actually, I think, I don't have the numbers by hand now, but I think we spent about one third of the time of source map parsing actually just freeing up the memory from the parsing. Because we parsed it, we looked up four or five frames of information, and then we had to dump the whole JSON thing again. Uh, we also allocated nearly a gigabyte of memory for something that could have been like less than 100. Um, so that was, that was interesting. And then when we already went um, down this path of using Rust for source maps, uh, which was for JavaScript, we then also started using Rust for debug symbols. Um, so debug symbols are um, sort of the equivalent of source map for um, iOS or other native code. Um, you can uh, ship an executable to Apple. It will run on people's iOS phones. It will run on iOS, uh, on Android. But when a native crash is happening, um, you get very little information out of it. You basically are unable to resolve the function names on the crashing device because the function names are typically not there. Um, there. There are a bunch of formats that help you take the debug information stored in a separate file and then resolve it on the server side. And this is what we started using Rust for as well. Um, some of the information is still being processed by LLVM. So we have a LLVM C++, C++ binding for Python, 
but part of the information is actually now being consumed uh, in a Rust library. And the reason why we ended up using Rust for this was not that it was performance much nicer to do performance-wise, but it actually turns out the ecosystem is so strong um, that there are already better libraries for Rust for dealing with debug information data than there's actually for C++. Um, not because LLVM doesn't have that um, or is better at that. LLVM has consumers for this data formats, but the API is very awkward to use um, in comparison to how easy it is to use Rust for this. So we work much quicker building this in Rust than we were, uh, would have been able to with C++. Uh, the last part where we now introduced uh, Rust is ProGuard data parsing. ProGuard is sort of the equivalent of source maps for Java. So if you have an Android application, you can minify function names to figure out what the original function name was. There's a huge text file you can parse. Uh, we actually use a regular expression engine for this, and it turns out to be sufficient. Um, but the, we use the Rust regular expression engine, which is very quick, um, and it's very nice to use. Um, so this is also um, an area where we now have Rust running. Um, so the part where it's a little bit hard to, to do what we are doing currently is, is actually getting a, an extension module running for Python. Um, and the reason for this is that, um, the reason for this is that when you compile an, uh, an extension module for Python, there are two ways in which you can do it, and the most common one is the one we didn't want to do. Um, the most common one is you compile your extension module against libpython. And libpython is the internal uh, library that comes with Python, which exposes the API of the Python interpreter. Um, so for starters, this means that you can only target CPython, which is the standard Python implementation. If someone were to use PyPy, it doesn't work because the emulation layer is quite slow and it doesn't really do what you want to do. So if your goal is performance gains, then a C extension is not the way to go on, on PyPy. Um, but we're not using PyPy. The, for us, the bigger reason why we wanted to avoid libpython is that libpython is not stable, which means that if a new version of Python comes out, you actually need to recompile for this version of Python. And not just only for this version of Python, you also have to compile it for this particular ABI version of Python. In particular, we're still using Python 2 to some degree. And on Python 2, uh, it actually is that there are different versions of Python for larger and smaller Unicode characters. And they have different ABIs, which means that if we want developers to have a good development experience with our own libraries, our goal is to distribute binary versions of these Rust dependencies that everybody can just install them on their computer without having to pip install, uh, with them having to do um, a, a local cargo build. So the goal is they can just pip install, which is the Python packager, um, the dependency, and it will come in a second instead of having to compile uh, and pull in all the dependencies. Um, so by avoiding libpython, we can build three versions, two for Linux, one for OS X, which is good enough for this set of systems we support. Um, and if we would link against libpython, we would have to do uh, about 24 for each version of the library, which we distribute. Um, for a while, we did this manually. Um, now we are moving towards this project. Um, let's just go back. It's called, well, I can see it now. It's called Snake. Um, and it's an extension for setup tools where you can build uh, Python extension modules that link against Rust. And here you can see that there is an um, installation requirement, which means that during the setup process, you want to pull in our dependency, which is called Snake. Um, and then this dependency extends this code so that you can run sna uh, Rust Snake modules. And the first part is where it will generate in the virtual module for Python, where it will show up so you can import all your Rust code from there. And the second part is on the file system where the sources lie. So in this case, you have a Rust folder and all the Rust sources are in there. And then you can build Python wheels, what it's called. It's um, kind of like char files on, on Java where the extension module is already pre-compiled in it. So you, all you do is download a zip file um, and it gets loaded directly from there. Um, so our goal is to move everything to Snake. We haven't done it yet. We still use our own hacks. Um, but hopefully in, in a month or two, we'll have all of our stuff in using that reusable extension module. And then other users can do it as well. Um, yeah, so the, the way we, which we're doing this is we actually start out with writing um, a Rust library, usually. Um, so for instance, our ProGuard parser, our dwarf uh, format parser, 
are reusable Rust libraries, which we can use in the Sentry CLI client, as well as we can use on the server side. Then we built a separate module uh, which exposes the Rust module through a C ABI, so we then can consume it from any programming language which can consume C uh, uh, function calls, which in our case we use it for Python only, but it would also allow us to use this from Node.js or, um, or from a C++ library or anything like this. So we go to the most common denominator basically, um, and then we use Snake to automatically build Python bindings for, for this. And the Python binding is to come out at a very, very low level. So we don't have to build higher level wrappers for it. So here you can roughly see what the um, what an exposed C ABI looks like in Rust. So um, what you can see here is uh, you can mark structs as being representable in the same format as C. So it means that uh, this looks the same as if you would write struct point in C. Um, so there's a, there's a guarantee that the layout is the same. Um, and then we also mark the function as no mangle, which means that the function name will actually show up without any additional mangling that you have in Rust or C++, and then it can be consumed from the Python side. And then on the Python side, you would see that you import from this module, which, have, uh, which was created in the setup.py, so it's like example.underscore native in this case. In that module, there is a, uh, there is a one object called lib, um, and that on that lib object, there are all the functions which are exposed from Rust. And there are all the structs on there as well, so you can allocate memories for it and so forth. Um, and that becomes fairly straightforward to use. Obviously, there are some things you still need to do manually. For instance, um, in Rust, you have a concept called um, return values that are uh, sort of compound objects, where in case everything goes well, it's an OK value. In case there's an error, there's an error value. Um, and we have uh, we, we hand wrote a layer where if then error value comes through the C ABI, we convert it into a Python exception and then raise it as a Python exception, stuff like this. Um, we would like to automate some of that stuff uh, later on so that we can actually build higher level bindings for Python automatically uh, because uh, there are definitely some issues with this. For instance, we, we had a problem where um, we introduced a massive memory leak um, because there was um, the, the destructor in Python called the function in a slightly wrong way, and then it failed executing the function, and because constructors in Python are automatically capturing down the, um, the exception, we didn't actually see that the, the memory allocation failure, that the memory deallocation didn't happen, and then within like 15 seconds, the servers went down because uh, of, of the ones where it was deployed, they just ran out of memory. Um, and that is, that is a problem that you have if you manually write uh, memory allocation code, and we would like to automatically build uh, bindings for this, but we are not at this point yet. Um, generally, the things that we love in Rust are, this is my favorite, um, if you mark a struct in Python, uh, in Rust, you can automatically add these um, uh, standard, what's called trait implementations for it. So for instance, here you can say, please derive me a serializer for this struct. And there's a library called Serda, which will take this information and build a serializer and deserializer for it. And it doesn't just build a serializer and deserializer for it, it builds ones that are so good to use for all kinds of data formats um, that we never ran into a limitation with this, which is great. And that's, I have never had this experience before. So we con can consume arbitrary JSON uh, uh, web service APIs with uh, these structs, basically. So you can tell it to rename individual fields. Um, you can tell it to use default values from function calls and stuff like this. Um, and you just write this, and you get a serialize and deserialize so for free. You also get this uh, debug feature up here, I think is on there. So if you add debug, you can pretty print all your structs uh, rec recursively with automatic indentation and everything. And it's just a joy to debug. Um, so that is a massive time saver. Then, uh, and it's type safe, which is great. And then our API layer is actually super pretty. Um, all we have to do is we have a function called list deploys, which gives me all the deployments for an organization and a project. Um, and then we just call self get, which is our standardized way of doing get requests with HTTP. We give it uh, the URL. You can also see that we're using the formatting here. So path arc is a wrapper around an arbitrary string, which will automatically escape slashes correctly and stuff like this. Um, and then the question mark, which you can see over there, means uh, please do automatic error handling, which means that if the call fails with failure, it will convert the error into one that's specific to this library. Um, that's a very powerful feature in Rust and one we like a lot. It's the idea that if you have a library that fails with a failure, uh, for instance, you use curl, curl can fail with a specific error, uh, we can convert this curl error into a standardized error of our API. 
So a consumer of our API, or of our like internal API, will always get a very consistent error message. Um, so the, the errors, there's a central piece of code which runs everywhere, which normalizes error values. Uh, it's very powerful, and it's a, it's a good concept. So the idea is that if you hit this question mark and there's an error, the function will return with a converted version of this error. And then convert um, is a, well, it's also good. Uh, convert is a, is, is a function call which will convert the um, response value serialized. Um, so if you go for it, theoretically, there should be another slide. Well, maybe not. <laughs> perfect. Um, we can just skip this. Let's see. Uh, perfect. So, um, and this is code we use, um, which we started to enjoy a lot. The biggest one is, um, yeah. So, is is this uh, set of three uh, crates? The biggest one is um, is error chain. Error chain sets up automatic error conversion for you. So, if you have an error coming from curl or I/O or network or something like this, you can set up an automatic error conversion for this error specifically to your crate. Um, this is basically how we do most of the error handling. Then there's if chain. If chain is just a nice way to avoid a lot of nesting in Rust uh, and, and, and chain basically nested if calls into a much nicer way. Uh, and the last one is lazy static, which is um, a, just a very useful utility crate to set up reusable uh, global structures, which are initialized on first use. Um, so these are in almost all of our Rust code in there. Uh, it should actually just be built in the language, but they're not yet. Um, this is SERDA. Uh, the basic one just gives you serialization, deserialization support. And then there are so many specific versions of it. So for instance, we use uh, we do config file parsing with SERDA. We do uh, HTTP calls with SERDA JSON. Um, we, I think we're even parsing um, uh, Apple-specific plist files with SERDA at this point. So there are a lot of these really good libraries that you can use with it. Um, and I, I fully stand by it. I think SERDA is the best serialization deserialization library I've ever used in any program language. Um, and then these are ones that we wrote. Um, uh, they're surprisingly named French, uh, had nothing to do with the conference. Um, the, these are libraries that uh, can help you build uh, really nice looking user interfaces for the console. So for instance, we have one uh, that just does colors and has different supports for er erasing lines and re repainting. Uh, then indicative, whatever you call it, uh, is doing uh, progress bars similar to the ones that you have in Yarn and JavaScript. Um, and what we got out of this is uh, just a much nicer experience in using our command line tools, because they used to just spit out ridiculous amounts of output, which nobody wanted to look at, and now they just make nice progress bars, and if they encounter errors, they will spit out some other stuff and make it look really nice. Um, and the last library on there is uh, giving you those basic uh, console input, uh, yes, no questions, menus, and, and stuff like this. Um, and then this is um, generally, I think, the best way right now for a lot of people to do HTTP requests. Rust curl uh, uses curl. The nice thing about Rust curl is that it actually uses curl on the system if available, and if not, it will automatically compile it in. And then probe OpenSSL is a library that will help you configure OpenSSL specifically for all environments that you can find. This is great because it will find the OpenSSL certificates on your system in the most b bizarre locations. Um, so just putting that in means that it works on Alpine, it works on most Linuxes, works on OS X, um, and it just makes OpenSSL magically work, which is great. Um, yeah, and then we, uh, for XML, we ported the Python elementary library to Rust. So we do all uh, XML parsing with this at the moment. Um, and then the one thing that we don't like uh, is compile times. And that's sort of my personal pet peeve, especially coming from Python. I dislike that everything takes so long. Um, part of the reason for this is unfortunately that the unit of compilation in Rust is a crate and not an individual file, which means that you recompile more stuff than looks like would be necessary for the change that you did. Um, but this is the situation we're in. So what we actually want uh, is... Uh, well, actually, I was expecting the slide to be up there saying um, we want um, incremental recompilation, which will eventually come. But I think what we also want is to teach people to use Rust code better. It's a guide of things not to do. Because Rust is a language, and sort of the, the, the most important thing you can take away is it's very different from everything else you've used before, because it gives you a very uh, a, a strong sense of how to deal with memory ownership. And 
it refuses to compile a lot of stuff where you think that should work, but Rust has a very good reason for why it doesn't work. There's some cases where it really doesn't let you compile it even though it would be sound, but that's something that I think the language will improve. Um, but Rust makes you reconsider a lot of stuff that you took for that is actually good code, and it will tell you no, that is not good code. Um, so I think to reduce the frustration that first time Rust programmers have, there should be a guide of all the things not to do, so that you don't keep running into those walls. Because nothing is more frustrating than spending an hour on doing something until someone tells you afterwards you can never do this because this is not sound. Uh, so I think a guide would be great there. And I think that's pretty much everything I have, um, other than this, uh, which it would be great to have a higher level abstraction layer to expose Rust ABIs to other consumers. And if you have any questions, I don't know if there's still time. Otherwise, just uh, talk to me uh, after the presentation.